Is it recording? Okay, um, so the, you are no longer watching this live. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see this soon. But yes, brothers and sisters, this has been uh, a difficult day. Um, not just for us, but all around the world. And so, so with that, uh, our question for today is, have you ever had a serious injury? Um, Evan, I need you to go back to the PowerPoint if it's off a bit. Um, and so, so yeah, Tinso mentioned that he injured his pelvis. Um, you know, hamstrings, I don't know if any, have you, any of you injured your hamstrings, sprained your hamstring? This is a very common injury among athletes because you're starting, you're stopping, and so it's, it's a, a, a series of, of, of muscles um, that, that, you know, right, right, right around here, right below, uh, right above your knee, that, that, you know, that when you injure it, it's difficult to walk, it's difficult to run. Um, but again, this is something that normally athletes go through. And so for me, I've never injured my hamstring. The only, like, one of the serious injuries I had, I had uh, plantar fasciitis. Uh, plantar fasciitis is, uh, it's, it's when you injure one of the ligaments in your foot. Um, this is actually another common injury among athletes, but the reason why I had it is because this is also known as the flip-flop disease. I, I wore flip-flops for a whole, whole summer, and so after doing so, I had messed up that ligament and I couldn't walk for a couple of weeks. Um, so yes, my injury was not because I was athletic, but because I was wearing flip-flops. Um, but yes, uh, so with that, let's go to the passage today, Joshua 11, starting with verse 1. Open your Bibles, look at the screen. Starting from word, uh, verse 1, the word Lord says this, When Jabin, king of Hazar, heard of this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Manah, to the kings of Shimron and, and Akshav, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Naphoth, Thor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashores. All of these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to greater Sinai, to Misrephoth, Maim, and, and to the valley of Mizpah on the east until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazar and put its king to the sword. Hazar had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed, and he burned Hazar itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds, except Hazar, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all the Lord, uh, of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills, from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal God in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and put them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time, except for the Hivites living in Gibeon. Not one city made a treaty of peace for the Israelites, who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Anam, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them in their towns. No Anakites were left in Israel territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land, uh, then the land had rest from war. Amen. Um, again, our theme for this year, ironically as it is, is one of victory, um, one that we hope to experience many breakthroughs. And honestly, I think there's a lot to learn from the things that are going on, and there will be some time before we truly understand everything that's going on. But my hope is that we will experience many victories, um, even in the midst of these trials, and even in the midst of not even being able to meet together as one body. We've been going to the book of Joshua, and, and we're getting kind of near the end of the conquest. Basically, next week, we're gonna, it's going to be a summary of all the kings that, that Joshua defeated. Um, and then basically from that point on, it's going to be talking about the visions of land. And so we're getting toward the end. We saw how, how Moses passed on leader, leadership to Joshua, who was by no means a young man. He was basically around 80 years at this point, 80 years old. But God empowered him through his word, through his presence, um, through faith. And even though he made some missteps in terms of not inquiring of the Lord when it came to the Gibeonites, um, and, and, and made some small mistakes, for the most part, he was very obedient. And so last week we saw that, that as he was fighting these five kings from the south, you know, God intervened in amazing ways. But even though God intervened, throwing hail upon them, Joshua even asked for more. He asked for the sun to stand still, for the moon to stand still. Joshua made a bold request and God answered him. And so in, that, in the light of that, in the light of God acting supernaturally, we're going now to the northern kingdoms. And so we see here that there's this one king, just like last week, there was one king. And in this king, Jabin, the king of Hazar, he gathers all the northern kings. And they're like, you know what? We got to band together. Israel defeated Jericho. They defeated Ai, the Gibeonites. Um, basically surrendered to them, and they defeated five kingdoms at once. And so the northern kings all come together. And you know, what it says here from verse 4, it says, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Right? They had horses, they had chariots, and they all came together. One thing that, that wasn't mentioned before was horses and chariots. And, uh, you know, horses and chariots, if you guys have watched the movie Gladiator, there's a scene where, where uh, you know, uh, was it Maximus Aurelius and, 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 and his, his uh, gladiator cohorts, they had to fight a chariot, right? Chariots were basically the strongest, uh, you know, the strongest piece of equipment for war back then. It's like today, like your nuclear weapon. And so the fact that they defeated them in that movie, like that's a very big deal. But basically, horses and chariots, if someone had those against you, and you were just standing on the ground, you had no chance. And so these armies had many of these. And this was not just horses and chariots. This was a, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So brothers and sisters, what I want to make very clear in this chapter is this is the greatest foe that Joshua has seen. Last week, there was five kings. It doesn't even list how many kings are, are here because there were so many. And so this is a, a huge army, right? Just from a logical point of view, Israel, Joshua, they have no chance. And so what happens? Well, I, I threw in this picture because basically, you know, I'm, I like the Avengers. I like MCU. This is the equivalent of the Avengers, just... You know, the few of them fighting battles by themselves. So, you know in that scene where you, know, you hear the to your left, you know, and then all the, all the soldiers come in from, from that, that, that had disappeared. This is like the small group of people fighting an entire army by themselves. This is the, the level of, of conflict that is coming up. But the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them because by this time tomorrow, I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring the horses and burn their chariots. 
So God says, I'm going to make this happen for you. Don't be afraid. At this point, Joshua has heard this type of message from God multiple times. And at this point, he understands what God says is true. I need to listen to him. I need to obey. So Joshua goes into this knowing that the Lord will provide. But the question I have here is, why would you hamstring the horses and chariots? Right? To hamstring a horse, you're basically permanently injuring a horse so it can no longer run. After you hamstring a horse, and horses basically, the strongest horses are the ones that run the fastest, right? That, that, can, that can do so many things. You are permanently limiting it. From that point on, a hamstrung horse can only be used for labor. Cannot be used for war anymore. And then burning the chariot. So like I said, God told Joshua, these weapons of warfare, I want you to destroy them. I don't want you to take them as your own. Logically, this makes no sense. Logically, if Joshua were, were to defeat these people, why not take these weapons and be even stronger? Right? That is the most logical thing. But God says, you know what? Get rid of them. You don't need so when you look at Deuteronomy 17, and this is um, the passage that talks about the king that Israel is meant to have. This passage says, The king, moreover, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. What this passage is telling you is that God doesn't want his people to depend on their ability and their resources. God is basically saying, depend on me. It's not about raising a strong army. It's not about gathering all these amazing war horses and, and weapons of warfare. Instead, depend on me. Don't depend on the strength of your military. Depend on me. I will make this happen. Now here's the interesting thing. When you actually read what happens in this battle, it's not like the previous chapter where you have um, the army being thrown into confusion, where you have hail coming down and then Joshua says, sun stop, moon stop. No, there is absolutely nothing supernatural that's listed in this passage. And this is actually the greatest enemy that Israel has faced so far. But God, Provides. Not in an amazing way, but God did just as He said. So, brothers and sisters, God did it. God won this war. God defeated these enemies. It isn't about the resourcefulness of Joshua, it isn't about um, the battle testedness of his soldiers. No, God did it. And what is very, well, what comes up again and again in this chapter is the simple fact that Joshua, his main role was he obeyed God. He did as God commanded. He followed every single command as exactly as it was said. And that is why he was able to win. So ultimately, the city Hazar uh, that, 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 uh, that this guy was king over it's destroyed. But what you also see is, just like in I, these other cities, the Israelites are able to get some of the plunder. Again, now what, it, what this is showing us is that God was providing for His people. God was allowing them to, to benefit from it, not just in terms of plunder and livestock, but most of these cities were not destroyed. And ultimately what you'll see later is, the Israelites went back and they lived in these cities. They didn't need to build houses because they were already there. So God provided for them in many, many ways. And what is continually emphasized is the obedience of Joshua, not just to God, but also to Moses. Moses was the one who gave him this command. Moses, who's, who's listed, who's, who's called the servant of the Lord, Joshua obeyed him, which meant that he was ultimately obeyed. So what do we see from this? What we see is 
is a very quick summary in that he wages war against all these these kingdoms for a long time, and then then you see that 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 God Himself hardened the hearts of these kings so that they would wage war. This is very similar wording to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go, God was hardening his heart. Why? So he could be glorified. Because if you think about it, as these kings were going into war, they realized Israel could not be defeated. Many of them could have been like, I surrender. But none of them did. Because God ultimately wanted to take them all out. So he hardened their hearts so they would continue to fight. But what, the, what, what this tells us is that this war, this conquest, it didn't happen all at once. Actually, most scholars, as you can see up there, believe that this took about seven years. And I'll talk about this again probably again next week when we, when we go through a summary of everything. But this fighting went for seven years. This was not a quick campaign. You remember Joshua is an 80 year old man. Fighting for seven years is not an easy thing. And he goes through this and he defeats all of these kings. And then it talks about the Anakites. Um, now, I, I put this picture of Bruce Lee and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. This is from the movie uh, uh, Game of Death. Um, you know, I'm a Bruce Lee fan. But, but um, this kind of shows you, like, one of the reasons why the Israelites didn't want to go into the land of Canaan 40 years prior was because they were afraid of the Anakites. The Anakites looked like giants to them. And so when they, when they sent the spies, the spies said, it's too dangerous. It's because of the Anakites. So what this passage makes very clear at the end of the chapter is that the Anakites were basically wiped out. So those people that the Israelites had feared and said, we can't do this, they did it. Joshua went in and defeated it. You know, kind of like Bruce Lee. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, he went through and he defeated these quote-unquote giants. So there's a full circle that's going around from those spies that were sent and ultimately what God provided. God did something amazing. So the, the passage ties up by saying, so Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. So Joshua defeated all these people. He obeyed what the Lord had told Moses. And now they're able to rest. Finally, after seven years of fighting. So what we can see from this is that God commanded Moses first. Moses then commanded Joshua. So what we can see from this is that passing of leadership was successful. Joshua listened. Joshua remembered the commands of Moses, and Joshua obeyed. So there is a successful passing of leadership, and we'll continue to see in this book of Joshua that Joshua passes this leadership to the next generation. This is a very important thing for us to understand as believers, is that we need to continually pass over strong spiritual leadership, strong understandings of God, strong obedience to God to the next generation. Continue on. Leadership. The measure of leadership is not how charismatic you are. The measure of leadership is not how, how, how quickly you make decisions or how good of a speech you give. No. What this passage says is it's for those who are obedient. If you obey God, that means you are a successful leader. Now what we see here also is that God gives graciously. These, these Israelites are fighting for God. God is using them as His agents, but He allows them to take good things from the land. He allows them to, to go back and settle into these cities that they did not destroy. So I want you to understand that the heart of God is He wants to give His children good things. A lot of times we think the opposite, especially in a time like now. Why is God allowing this to happen? Why are all these crazy things happening? God, the heart of God is He wants to give us good things. 
But the end goal, ultimately, brothers and sisters, of this entire conquest is they were fighting so that they could finally rest. After seven years of fighting, they were able to rest. They were able to enjoy the things that God had given them. They were able to enjoy an era of peace. And I think this is something that we as Christians, especially here in Korea, need to learn. God doesn't want us to work ourselves to death. Honestly, brothers and sisters, I think this is one of the things that God is teaching this nation through the coronavirus. In Korea, before this happened, if you were sick, you still went to work, you still went to school, right? You might wear a mask, maybe, not everybody did. But basically, the, the mentality was, you need to work, 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 work. Bari, 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 right? That was Korean culture. And I think God is challenging that. Now we're seeing that if you're sick, stay home, get some rest. Don't get us sick either, right? We're also seeing, you know what? You can work from home. You can use Zoom and all these other platforms. And honestly, I think some of this is going to be used in the future in Korea. Like God is going to allow companies to look at this and say, you know what? We don't need our people to be here 100 hours per week. If there are things they can do from home, that's fine. Do it from home. But one of the things I want us to understand, brothers and sisters, is that God wants us to rest. God wants us to work hard when we need to, but God also desires us to rest. That is the end goal. The end goal is to rest, to enjoy what God has given us, and to understand more about who God is through this. Now, God intentionally told Joshua to hamstring the horses to burn the chariots, right? Basically, God was saying, I want you to intentionally limit your military ability, even though you can gain. What I want us to get from this, brothers and sisters, now don't think this is the wrong way. Don't, don't be like, okay, God wants me to intentionally handicap myself, right? You're like taking a test and like, you know what? God doesn't want me to study. No, no, that's not true. Um, I want you to understand that it's very easy for us when we are successful, when we are able to do things, to misunderstand what that means. Because the point of this whole chapter is this, this deliverance, this victory that Israel has, even though it wasn't done supernaturally, the credit all went to God. So brothers and sisters, for us, if we are succeeding in, in the the you know, the schoolroom, if we're doing well in, in work, um, you know, if we're doing well in all these different things, the simplest thing for us to do as humans is to be like, oh wow, I'm awesome. This is because of me. I'm so gifted. I'm so talented. It's very easy for us to think like this. But what I want us to understand is the glory always goes back to God. You know those gifts that you have? God is the one who gave them to you. You know that, that amazing decision, that amazing uh, thought that you had? God is the one who put that into your head. So brothers and sisters, give credit where credit is due. Do not allow yourself to grow proud, to allow things to stumble you from seeing that God is the one who deserves the glory. Because that's a very easy thing to do. Don't let your pride get in the way, brothers and sisters. Understand that God is the giver. God is the doer. All of these good things that we have, God is the one who gave it to us. Our, the things that we're able to accomplish, God is the one who did it for us, whether it was natural or supernatural. This has been the point of the book of Joshua again and again and again. Yes, God used Joshua. God used the Israelites. But ultimately, he was the one who did it. He was the one who won every single battle. So brothers and sisters, especially in this time of, of, of a pandemic, you know, there's a lot of focus on solutions, right? I know Trump has been talking about this, this, this like cure for malaria that apparently might have some effect. There's people that are putting hopes into vaccines and things. Yes, God can work through those things, brothers and sisters. But I don't want you to miss the point that when things are resolved, when things are clear, ultimately God is the one who did it. 
We need to give credit where credit is due. We need to give glory to Him. That doesn't mean that we're just going to sit here and wait for Him. No, brothers and sisters, God is going to use each and every one of us in some type of way. And I truly believe when I'm looking at how big this issue has become, it's becoming very clear to me, brothers and sisters, that God is going to use Korea in a very special way. The simple fact that, that us and other nations have been able to overcome um, many things that other nations are really struggling with, that gives us opportunities to help people, right? Even if it's simply the fact of, you know, making more masks and sending them abroad. I know test kits are already going abroad. There are things as a nation that we can help this world with. And I truly believe, brothers and sisters, as a church, that if there are ways that we can look into practically helping areas of need, whether it's in Korea or outside, then we should do so. I know we have a, a sister that, that's been encouraging us to, to really help Italy. And honestly, brothers and sisters, I don't know if any country is going to get worse than Italy. And I think there, there is a conviction for us to practically do whatever we can to help. We're in a situation, brothers and sisters, compared to other nations, where we haven't shut down as much as other nations have. So we're actually not getting affected as significantly as other places. As I said last week, the economic consequences of what is going on are going to be huge. But that's also in this nation. People that are in the airline industry are getting laid off. People that are like, like travel agents, honestly, like they might as well just shut down a lot of places because there's nothing they can do. And so brothers and sisters, as I said last week also, if there are practical ways that you can support local businesses, Encourage people in your neighborhood. Then do so. If God is, is gifting you with a steady income where you still have the job and you're still able to, to help others, do so. So brothers and sisters, I truly believe that we are living in a period where God is giving us great opportunities. Great opportunities to shine His light. Great opportunities to, to be a source of encouragement and inspiration to others. So do not fear. Do not be afraid. Right? We can look at the coronavirus and it might seem like you know, the, the armies of Thanos or, or these northern kings rally against us. But brothers and sisters, don't be afraid. God is going to make this right. But in the meantime, if God is giving you a conviction on how to act and how to, to, to do things, then by all means, let's do it. Let's do it together. So brothers and sisters, as Joshua showed us, the real important thing for us to understand is we need to be obedient. So I encourage you guys, especially for those of you that you know, for whatever reason you're stuck at home, pray. Pray. Spend time in the Word. Because what I, when you do that, God is going to give you convictions. Act upon those convictions. Encourage others. Receive. As the, 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 the people of, of, of Israel receive many good things. Receive these things. Right? Honestly, we are living in a good situation. Many of us are, are, are not struggling as many others are. Receive these things, but ultimately don't allow that to, to fuel your pride, but instead depend on God, trust in Him, and know that He is the one who is ultimately going to do it. Let's take some time to pray and go ahead and close for today. I want us to take a moment to really just intercede for the nations. Honestly, many nations have zoomed past us. So I want us to pray for those nations. I want us to pray for Italy. I want us to pray for Iran. I want us to pray for America, um, Germany, Spain, England, all these nations.
really want us to think sometimes to intercede on their behalf that, that God would give their leadership wisdom, that, that God would, would provide different things to the, the medical needs that they have. So let's really just pray that God would intercede on behalf of these nations right now. Let's pray. Even more during the season. 
that we wouldn't allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by, by all these other things, but to know, Lord, that you are still at work. And so, Father, first off, we thank you, Lord, that we are in a nation, Lord, that is actually in many ways succeeding. But, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in caution, to walk in wisdom, and to act the way that is right before you. Help us to be obedient, to listen to you. But Father, also, help us to not grow, grow proud, Lord, especially in the midst of, of the quote-unquote success of this nation, that we wouldn't grow so proud of ourselves, but that instead that we would see that, God, you are giving us an opportunity to serve others. You are giving us an opportunity to be a light to areas of, of great darkness, Lord. So, Father, give us boldness, give us courage, give us strength to be like Joshua, to be obedient, to trust in you. And to know, Lord, that you are the one who is going to make this right. You are the one who is going to deliver us. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus.
may know to be strong and courageous as you have commanded us. So God, help us to not shy away in our faith. But Lord, help us to grow in our spirits, Lord, as we obey and trust you, Lord. God, let this be a time, Lord, where the light shines through the darkness, God, that we will see victory crack open in places that we have never imagined before. Let this be a time where the gospel goes and triumphs in forth through the corners where we have never imagined before. So, God, would you open doors for our communities and our neighborhoods and every nation. Let the name of Jesus, the victorious name, ring more from every corner to corner. God, we await for you. God, let your spirit, let your presence be known. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Just to close it out, um, in terms of how much longer we're going to be doing no. the online service, it's done, right? It's, it's fine. It's going. It's going. Um, so basically, uh, we don't know exactly. But most likely, our service will continue this way at least through the early to mid part of April. Um, but again, a lot of this really depends on the situation here in Korea. So we're watching that very closely. Um, but most likely, once the elementary, middle, and high school is open, we're probably going to follow a very similar schedule. Um, but again, that might get moved back. Um, but just be aware of that. Um, I know that you know we. It's difficult for us in the sense that we can't meet, but let's just continue to stay in touch with each other, um, and to pray for each other, and do what we can through the means that we have. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pray the benediction, and we'll close for today. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We just pray, Lord, that you would again remind us, Lord, that victory only comes through you. It's not through our means. It's not through our abilities. It's only through you. So, Father, help us, Lord, to. Be obedient to the convictions that you give us, to trust in you, to depend on you. And Lord, that you would use us, Lord, in ways to proclaim your gospel, Lord, not only in our neighborhoods, not only in this nation, but to the many nations, Lord. Use us in that way. May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us as we seek to be men and women that listen, obey, trust in you. We thank you and praise the name of Jesus.